Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. So this is the first day of a Yoon suk Yeol presidency. You know, after all the drama, you know, with his wife and himself during the campaign. Well, today was inauguration day and it's his first official day as our new president. And I just wanted to go over some of the highlights and the tea from the big ceremony. So overall, this was extremely well produced. I don't know if it's all of the experience that South Korea has from covering the Winter Olympics and then, you know, like 30 years ago was like the Summer Olympics, but live events with different camera angles, even drone footage and various locations. I mean, it was all so well pieced together. The ceremony itself ran super smooth. It didn't feel like it dragged at all. So overall, I would say that for an inauguration, this was extremely well done. And if we kind of like judge if there's because, you know, sometimes you can tell whether there's like infighting or not, or if the team is like doing well or not based on like, you know, you can kind of pick up a few things on, especially on like a live event. But it seems like hopefully because this is what he's trying to say to the nation that this is going to be an administration, not of like VIPs, but for the people and that he'd have more open communication with the people. And it did feel actually like there was less ego, less fighting, and it was just simple, clear, just get the job done, get it through, get it efficient, and I thought overall it looked kind of spectacular. There were no huge high profile celebrities as the performers as usually there are in other previous inaugurations, and that was fitting with the theme of being more of this humble, kind of president and ushering a humble presidency. Remember, like, he had stuck to his guns. The transition committee dug its heels in by saying that they were going to leave the Blue House. So it's as if, like, you know, the new U.S. president would not move into the White House. Well, he decided not to move into the Blue House because of the image of it being like, a palace but more than that there's something about that place where when you go in there you start acting like an emperor and not just you as a president but all the people around you getting th you know thinking that they're so you know high and mighty and disconnected to the people and you really are like disconnected so during the actual inauguration speech this is why i thought it was a little bit amazing they timed <laughs> the opening of the blue house to the public because that was his campaign pledge he's like i'm moving out i'm not gonna live there i'm not gonna work there we're gonna return it to the people and make it like a place where people can have picnics and then they can because you know it's like 66 acres and it's beautiful inside and they can tour the different buildings the buildings aren't ready yet and they had like all the right you know representation of like making it look like old young male female and even i saw that they had put people from outside the country to kind of show like it's going to be like multicultural. It's a little bit, I'm still a little bit, you know, iffy on that if they're just doing that as like virtue signaling, especially with the anti-discrimination bill that's on the docket that people are trying to push through like after like 20 years, but that's going to be the next video. So he left his house early or in the morning so the official ceremony started at 11 a.m and we got a little bit of a glimpse of what his commute would be because before the presidential residence has been set because they haven't decided exactly where he's going to be living if he's not going to live in the blue house so he's going to live in his own private home for now and they're going to block off the traffic and block off the streets and then like have him have his own special motorcade so that he doesn't even have to understand how hard it is to get to work on time. You know, if you want to be a real man of the people, you get rid of that motorcade and you sit in that traffic and you see all the different like 
problems that need to be fixed with like even the way the the streets are like you know painted anyhow so we got a preview of what his motorcade would be like and the rumor is is that he's gonna like travel like at four or five in the morning so that you know citizens aren't like complaining because he's living in Gangnam and so like he's gonna like you know clog up Gangnam so then he went to the National Cemetery first to do the uh, pre-inauguration commemoration of the Patriots to South Korea and his wife wore black and this was like the kind of the first time we've seen her publicly because you know she's been taking a little bit of a low profile because they promised that she wasn't gonna you know dip her hands in the cookie jars all over the place and be not a f actual first lady the way that the first ladies in the past have been more uh regimented and also like formalized with their own office with activity she said that she's going to be more of a private citizen however yeah let's go on a little bit of a sip of tea she has been testing it already so like for one event for buddha's birthday she went in lieu of her husband people were like mm, she's like you know looks like she's kind of crawling out of that cocoon trying to be a first lady you know seeing if the people you know forgive her already and then there's just been this whole controversy and scandal over the presidential residence and they might use the the former or the current house of the ministry the minister the foreign minister and the foreign minister's house is you know, very beautiful but there have been like controversy stirred up by the opposing liberal party saying that oh well we heard that when she came in she didn't come in without an she didn't even come in with an appointment she was carrying her dog and she even made the foreign minister's wife leave like saying like i want to take a look around here see how many bedrooms and bathrooms there are like you know you need to get out of here while i you know take a look around at your house and people are just like how can you tell a lady who's over 70 years old to just like you know get out of the house so that you can take a look at it as if you know you're on like some realtor open house tour but they claim that that didn't really happen and then the liberals are like well let me let's get the cctv footage so that was kind of like the pre-inauguration drama so they went to the national cemetery and then they went to the national assembly compound which is basically our capitol hill where the lawmakers have their main building that's where the inauguration ceremony happens and during this time, though, they also coordinated and they, beautiful, beautiful camera work. They also showed how Moon Jae-in was having his last event at the Blue House and that he was leaving the official residency for the last time. And that would be like the last time this was like the president's house. And then, you know, he left and he came to the ceremony as well. Now, it's not as if there weren't any other dignitaries, just some of note that I think that you guys might care about was you know the old grandpa in the squid game yeah he was there they invited him he, he had like a front row seat and from the United States the delegation included and was uh, spearheaded by Doug Emeroff Kamala Harris's husband so he's the second gentleman of the United States so he came to see the ceremony and yes former president Pakane was also there and she sat right behind Yoon suk -yeol. so you might not have noticed her but like sometimes you saw her like face over his shoulder and she was like wearing those sunglasses looking like a creepy ajuma like my goodness wearing like some purple blouse like what's she trying to say like she's still the queen mm. i mean apparently she's not in the best of health so yeah that's kind of sad but she you definitely didn't put my career in the best of health after her all of her corruption so yeah bless your heart girl so what was the overall tone I think he actually did a very measured, stable, kind of standard speech. It wasn't boring because, you know, he's always like, boom, boom like, you know, like he's a little bombastic, um, you know, in that old man style. But I thought he was simple and clear. So that was that was good. And 
he generally focused on saying that he wanted to strengthen Korea and, you know, had a little bit of a tinge of like, you know, the, the slogan was like, you know, Korea again. So maybe like make America great again, you know, so kind of like, yeah, well, OK, if you kind of can overlook that part, his main point was that like we need to move forward and create fast, sustainable growth. So he's definitely taking, a, you know, the page book from the conservative president handbook of like, let's try to solve problems through economic growth, you know, raise all boats, like let's increase the pie, let's create more opportunities for everybody. And yeah, like a lot of the business, like, you know, the Chebo leaders were there, you know, Mr. Uh, Head of Samsung was there, but they didn't really give him a lot of camera time. You know, I think they were trying to like, you know, put him on the more of the down key, but he was, he was definitely there. And so he's saying that it's through science and technology that, you know, South Korea will be able to continue to develop. He mentioned, you know, we're the 10th largest economy in the world and that, you know, economic growth is going to be like the driver for the development and equality. And so then he kind of went into saying like, you know, talking about the concept of freedom and how freedom has to be there for everybody. It's not just for the winners, that there is a right for freedom for everybody. If one group does not have freedom, then we all don't have freedom. And now that is a hopeful sign and it may be a clue and a hint saying that there actually may be a presidential push for the anti-discrimination bill that has been really a hot topic. And he had to address that somewhat, I believe, because there have been hunger strikes in front of of the National Assembly and in front of basically where they were setting up for this big inauguration, they have been hunger striking for, I think, almost a month and trying to get the National Assembly and the new government to pay attention to this anti-discrimination bill that has been going through over and over and over and being ignored by the National Assembly. Like it goes in and then it kind of sits on the pile because there's all of these scary protesters. We'll get that. We'll get to that in the next video. But I think it was very interesting that he was very pointed in the way that he said that, you know, it's that we have to have freedom for all. So I wonder what that would exactly mean. We know his cabinet does not have a lot of women, but from the way that we saw a lot of the inauguration ceremony take place, there was still a lot of virtue signaling. Like even the kids that greeted him when he came into the National Assembly complex, there was like two little kids with flowers, you know, they always have that. Well, one kid was from Tegu, which is the his hometown and also the conservative block region, sort of like the American South. And then one girl from Gwangju, which is basically like the liberal side on the West. And that is where the uh, May 18th democratization, you know, movement started, you know, where like the former dictator, like in 1980, Chun Doo-hwan was accused of like even like spraying bullets on his own people during a, a whole demonstration for, from helicopters. So that was like a virtue signaling kind of a thing, but it did show that they were paying attention to sort of like national unity and symbols of that. Now, people were also saying like, well, you know, if there wasn't discrimination based on where you're from, because basically people from Gwangju, people from the Chola region are discriminated against. Like, I mean, if you're listening from America and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, people are like discriminated against because they're Asian. Well, come to Korea. Well, you know, even within Korea, we can splice it up and discriminate against each other too. And, <laughs> and so that was one kind of way of them. Like, I think there were the details, what I'm trying to say, were very much paid attention to. And then they really did want to make it look like there was a multicultural face to the dais. And then even the performance, uh, the highlight performance of singing Arirang and then also like a opera song by this old men's like opera choir, I thought was also kind of quite genius because 
It was conducted by a conductor who was disabled in a wheelchair. So then again, it starts to signal that th maybe this administration does care about the minority rights. And but then at the same time, you only had like these old men. So you had to kind of like honor the old man or like that almost misogynist, but just that male voting block that he depended on in order to get into office. But they were kind of hip in a way like well, when they first started singing, I was like, oh, my God, this is so like, uh. but, you know, like it's artistic and like they were great singers and the performance was really, you know, riveting. But in any event, it showed like, you know, like, like the old guys also have a place in this new developing modern society you know we see you although i bet you half of those opera singers they probably also benefit from an anti-discrimination law if you know what i mean so then we also had topics of defense and north korea with the speech and Yoon's main point was that the door to dialogue is always open and he is taking it back towards more of the conservative angle and a bit of like the Pakune, maybe even Imyong Bak playbook of basically saying like if you denuclearize then we will give you economic benefits and he even used I guess a term that's been translated into an audacious package of economic growth and development. So, I mean, it's just like some, it, it is kind of like the playbook that we've had before, you know, you denuclearize, we're going to give you like wonderful economic treats and incentives. Usually it always ends up in a stalemate because North Korea always is looking at the countries that have given up their nuclear weapons. And if they were dictatorships, especially did they get economic goodies that transform them? Usually the dictator got decapitated. So they're probably not gonna, you know, he's probably, probably gonna have to find a new way on that. And he may, especially with An Su in his corner. An Su is the brains. An Su was also there on the dais, very prominent, and looking like, you know, he was... He was in a strong position, although his wife, I think, was looking all pissed, thinking like, you know, my husband should have been the president. But it was very interesting that Yoon suk yeol in terms of like the intellectual part, said that this government is going to be about um, fighting against anti-intellectualism. <laughs> And people were saying like, oh, that is like a term that we've never heard before. And I thought that was like, oh, that is a diplomatic way of saying like, you know, we ain't going to be some dumb government, some stupid government coming up with dumb policies that aren't thought through, that aren't based in facts and that aren't tested through some sort of like at least rigorous research. Because a lot of the policies that came out of the Moon administration, if you kind of think of it in a positive way, the well-intentioned, oh my goodness, like didn't have some brains behind it, didn't even have like any kind of like testing on it. Like, like with the real estate policy, I was shocked when the, the real estate policy people like who brought it out, they were saying, you know, people were like, okay, so is this going to work? You know, it is, are these like really market restrictive policies on real estate going to actually bring down the prices? And they were like, yeah, we think so. It should, you know, like, it, it, I mean, like mo most likely, you know, in a few months, like there should be more houses on the market. They were sounding like my neighborhood realtor. Like, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, there should have been more than that as your explanation. Like, we hope so. And it didn't. It actually had the opposite effect and, you know, raise prices. So he's trying to say that, you know, this is going to be a government that's going to think before it acts. Hopefully, perhaps we can trust him on that. We'll have to wait and see. So overall, I think the transition committee because of An Chol Su. Now I want to give props to An Chol Su because I do think that he is the quality behind, you know, this Yoon Suk Yeol presidency so far. So let's give credit to why it seems 
a lot more organized than I expected it would be, and things moved along a lot quicker than I expected it to be, and we're going to have President Biden come for a summit in a couple weeks, like May 20th to the 22nd. Apparently, this is the fastest we've ever had a state visit from a leader of another country to greet the new president, like in 10 days, unheard of. And I do think that that's probably because the transition committee was so well organized because it was run by An Chol Su and that we have An Chol Su, somebody without an inferiority complex, just wants to get the job done. And I would say even Yoon Suk Yeol has no inferiority complex and just kind of wants to get the job done. Although I don't trust his family because the family might have some other stuff going on in there. But these two seem like a good team. And hopefully, so if you're kind of wondering like what's been going on with Ancho Su, well, he's going to be running for the National Assembly in the by-elections in June. So most likely he's going to win. It's the district south of Seoul in Pundang. That's where his company is based. And that really sets him up for a great position to then have a lot more par power within the National Assembly and then also perhaps even become like the leader of the party and, you know, kick out that little kid that everybody has problems with like you know it was a little bit of frosty you know even on the dais between Yoon Suk Yeol and Lee Jun Suk so we'll see if that gets resolved or if that mm, something something happens but overall I think it's a great start and today I think was a good day for South Korea and it may be hopeful and I do think that it would have been a much different picture if it was like somebody else on that dais who we still need to see whether this whole scandal over the land development deal, you know, with E.J. Myung is going to move forward with more force. But apparently there has been new tape recordings that have come out and yet... Lee Jae Myung is also going to be running for National Assembly in the by election. So he's already come back out of the woodwork, even though he said that he was going to take a pause from politics, but he's coming back. And so, whoa, like this, it's kind of like, you know, the whole presidential debate, you know, the whole presidential race between like the three front runners, like, boom, the game board has been like kind of reset and they're still going to, there's, they're going to be like most likely in our faces uh, for the foreseeable future. So it's going to be pretty juicy, I think so. All right. Well, what do you guys think? Do you think overall this was a good thing or you still wanted the other guy or, you know, hopeful? We got to see, you know, like how much power he actually has over his own party, whether he can work with the other party who is still in the majority in the National Assembly. So... And, and we have to see, like, whether civil society groups are going to start changing the power dynamic because right now it's kind of like the real radical conservatives that are creating a lot of noise. But it seems as if, like, the, maybe the tide can be shifting and, like, there's just going to be a lot more ordinary people just, you know, basically saying, like, look, get her done. Get it done because that's what he said he wanted to be a practical president that got things done. And that requires the practical people of Korea to stand up and say, like, look, we will support you. And when all the crazy people who are like, you know, making all this noise and probably been paid, you know, like $10 a day to, you know, just like, you know, be there and they're not real, you know, like, the, you know, the people that Trump hired. Don't be afraid of them to lose your spot as a National Assemblyman. Trust us that we will continue to vote for you. So that is all on the onus of the practical Korean people. All right, guys. Well, comment below. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye. Tune in next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Love you.